you turn your King James Bible to Luke chapter 12, I'm going to talk today about ministry disqualifications. Um, all men have sinned. All men are sinners. That is very true. But when you have a man that comes into the position of being a preacher, a bishop, as the Bible calls it, the word pastor is given there as, in terms of just a d description, not really a title. So don't ever call me Pastor Brian or whatever else. I'm just Brother Brian. That's all I am. There's no official titles in the New Testament. Um, again, Bishop is not, you know, Bishop Brian or something. No, it's a description. Okay, we'll get into the, all this today in the study. But we understand all have sinned. But when God puts a man into the position of leadership within the church, within the body of Christ, God calls a man to that. And it's always men. There's never women that are called into the position of being a pastor, preacher, bishop, whatever. Uh, you'll never see that in the New Testament. You go outside of the New Testament, that's where you're going to find it. Um, women are not supposed to hold positions of authority within the church, the body of Christ. Um, not my opinion, it's what the scriptures teach. Um, so, But whenever there's a man that's put into a position of authority, that man now has a very high calling and he has to live a very high a moral life. You no longer have freedom to just kind of, well, I messed up and I'm just whatever. There are certain things that will disqualify a man from ministry. And the Catholic Church is very famous for, uh, there's a, a guy, a priest that's a pedophile or a bishop or others like that, and they just ship them off to some other place. Well, he got caught messing with children here, so we'll just ship him over here to this church. You say, well, you, you hate Catholics. You're, you're always attacking Catholics. Well, let me just say it this way as well. There's also Protestants that do the same thing. Uh, the independent fundamental Baptist movement has some of the biggest sex perverts in the entire you know, professing Christian church out there. Uh, it goes on all the time. And these guys are just perverts and they cover up for each other and whatever else. And, oh, brother, so-and-so, yeah, let's not talk about his personal life. I mean, you have skeletons in your closet too. See? I know, I know how all the little games are played. I've been in the Baptist churches. I know all about these things. You want to do a little psychiatric evaluation of me and you were hurt in the past. That's why you're lashing out at this. You know, whatever. Have fun doing your little thing. The reality of it is a man of God will call out sin. There's no favoritism within the body of Christ. God is no respecter of persons and we shouldn't be either. If I have sinned, the Bible talks about, you know, an elder that sinned, that you're to rebuke them before all that others also may fear. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, it talks about that. Okay, you don't receive an accusation against an elder, but, you know, before two or three witnesses, but them that sin, you rebuke before all. Okay? There's no such thing as a guy in ministry that should be in there if he's perpetually living in sin. And I'm not talking, well, you know, there's a defined sin. Okay, the Bible makes it very clear, all right? Perversion is one of the biggest reasons that you get kicked out of ministry. But we'll get into it here. Luke chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. And there's a reason that you have to kick men out that get it messing around with sin. There's a reason for it. And we'll get into that. It says here, Luke chapter 12, verse 1, In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. I mean, if you're standing up there and you're preaching, you're some Baptist preacher with a big attitude, a big mouth and everything else, and you're preaching about righteousness and standards and these wicked sinners out there. And you yourself are doing a bunch of wicked sins behind the scenes. You know, I've known, you know, Baptists especially. And oh boy, they'll rail on the perverts. All oh, these sodomites. All oh, wicked sodomites. And then they, behind closed doors, are looking at sodomy in pornography. The form of pornography. Oh, they wouldn't do it, you know, themselves. But they'll get pleasure from it. Which the Bible condemns in Romans chapter 1 going into chapter 2. Hypocrisy. You know what it is? It's leaven. It gets in and it starts to ruin the body of Christ. That's why you have to purge it out. I'm getting ahead of myself. Verse 2. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Be sure your sins will find you out. 
And a lot of these guys, it's a lifetime of just sin and wickedness and they cover it up and they cover it up because, see, you get into the church situation, the Baptist pastor, and he's up there, and all the people come along and they worship him. Oh, Brother Hiles. Oh, it's Jack Hiles. Oh, I can't believe. Oh, I actually got to shake his hand. and Oh, they worship. And then they see him doing something you know, really perverted with some young girl or with his secretary, which he did, and you know, Deacon's wife, Jenny Nishik, his own children, you know, his own daughter came out and said, yeah, you know, he was messing around with you know, Jenny Nishik, having affairs with her and whatever else. The whole story, I covered it in my exposing of Jack Hiles. But what happens? The people see it, they see this evil, and they go, but it's the pastor. Hey, I can't go against the pastor. And then when some of them try to come out and blow the whistle on this guy, and hey, he's pretty corrupt, actually. Oh, well, you know, what about you, huh? It's not supposed to be that way. And you know, if you're messing around with sexual sins and perversion, God will bring it out. He will destroy you. So if the church doesn't handle you, God will. Verse 3, Therefore whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. You will be exposed eventually. Rabbi Zacharias, this pervert, coming out. Oh, he was a great man of God and all, all this other stuff. He was a pervert. And it came out after the guy died. It's a shame it didn't come out before he died. If you're messing around with perversion and you claim to be in ministry, God will expose you. If the body of Christ tries to cover it up, God will still bring it out. He'll show the truth. You aren't going to get away with it. I mean, think about David in the Old Testament. Did he get away with it? His sin with Bathsheba? No. God brought it out. Um, verse 4, And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Um, there's a lot of scriptures I could go over in this study. Some I'm just going to be referring to. We're not going to turn there just for sake of time. But in the book of Hebrews, it talks about being with, you know, that you're supposed to have chastisement. And one of the clearest marks of a false convert, a fake Christian, is that there's no chastening. They keep scamming people. They keep lying and things, and they just get away with it. And they'll make more money and more money, and their, you know, ministry will grow and grow. And I know some of you wicked little devils right now, you're thinking evil thoughts towards me, and you're saying, well, what about you? Your ministry is growing, and look at you. and what? Okay, here's what you can do. Go out and look for police records on me. Look for a criminal background on me. There isn't any. Um, look for women that I've cheated with. Oh, that's right. There aren't any. I've been faithful to my wife. My sermon I did years ago, it was an audio sermon, The Pornography Epidemic. And I had problems with pornography very early on in my salvation. Um, and before I was saved, I was a false convert, professing Christian. I had a lot of problems with pornography. And early on, it, I got saved and I was still struggling with it. And I said, I need to get victory over this sin and I need to stop it and never go back to it. And I, when I was going to preach that pornography epidemic, I said, I need to be clean from this pornography. And after I preach this, that has to be it. I can't go back to it again. And when I preached that sermon, God did something in me performed a miracle in me that just went boom and took away my desire for it. And I hated pornography after that. And I thank the Lord for it. It was a work of the Holy Spirit of God, a miracle in my life. Terribly addicted and just boom, stopped it. And since that time, I've been clean and I have no desire to ever go back to it again. And if you want to call me a liar and oh, I think it's you probably do whatever you want, but you have no proof. And it's your word against mine. And I think I know myself a little bit better than you know me. Even though some of you, you know, idiots out there think that uh, you know more about me and whatever else. I live a very clean life because the Holy Spirit within me convicts me. I want to be a preacher. I want more spiritual power. And I know that sin takes away spiritual power. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me, the Bible says. So if I'm secretly, you know, I've got some women on the side or whatever else, uh, 
God's not going to bless this ministry. I'll have no spiritual power. I want spiritual power more than anything else in this world. You say, hey, I'll tell you what. Uh, Bill Gates comes along and he says, I'm going to give you a billion dollars. You know, uh, whatever. Warren Buffett, any of the big, you know, supposed wealthy men. I'm going to give you one billion dollars if you drop your ministry. Keep your money. Send me a check. You don't, you don't believe me? Send me a check. Any rich person out there, send me a check. Here, this is yours to cash. If you stop your ministry, I will burn it on camera. I want spiritual power more than anything else. Because I know what money really leads to. You get huge amounts of money and things, it messes you up. Right? You fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. 1 Timothy chapter 6. I want spiritual power. That, to me, is the, the most enticing thing out there right now. And I realize you have to have some money and things coming into a ministry in order to get videos out and to make you know the new website and whatever. And thank you to all out there that uh, actually said we're happy for you getting a new website. Thank you. There were a few that were, oh, you know, just be careful. I don't know. You know. I guess I should just be living in a little burlap sack or something like that, and that would make me that much better, and I shouldn't be able to get out to people. And Labor is not worthy of his reward, you know, is working hard, you know, working six, seven days a week, every week. You know, I, I shouldn't be paid for that, you know. <laughs> Whatever. But my whole point is, I know how to get spiritual power, and it's by departing from sin. It's by being as clean as you can possibly be. You know, First Timothy chapter 3. Let's look at the qualifications for a bishop. You can falsely accuse me all you want to in the comments. Go ahead, attack me, whatever else. But uh, until you can prove anything, um, it's just false accusations. First Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil." Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Oh, yeah, is there a high calling there? Yes. You say, well, then you're a bishop, I guess. You think that you're a bishop? No, actually, I don't think I qualify yet. All right. I still get a little bit angry there, you know. Um, what's it say? Patient, not a brawler. Um, I get a little bit ticked off, and I say some things and whatever. And let me just say this. I need to just, you know... Some things I'd like to actually do a full big study on it, but I don't always need to do that. I just need to make a statement now and then just to clarify some things. You know why I call people stupid? You're so stupid. Don't, don't be such an idiot and whatever. Because I speak that way to myself. And I don't want any of you out there thinking that you're higher than you actually are. We're all stupid. We're all idiots at times. You know, there's sometimes I just, I pray to the Lord, I say, just please have mercy on me. You see how stupid I am. And that's why I preach that way. I don't preach that way out of hatred. I say it because you need to get yourself in check. You need to make sure that you're doing things that are right. Living in righteousness. You know, oh, well, you have to watch out for self-righteousness. Yeah, self-righteousness is you think that you're good and you don't need Jesus Christ. That's not biblical righteousness. Biblical righteousness is... I know that I'm no good, but I want to do right, and I need Jesus Christ to help me to do, to do right. All right? But, oh, oh well, you're, just, you're getting you know, a little bit too legalistic there and whatever else with all your standards. My standards come from the Scriptures. Well, yes, I know, brother, but you know, enjoy your salvation. Oh, you mean enjoy living in sin with, and trying to sear my conscience? No, thank you. I don't want to do that. You know, the Bible talks about letting it, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. We're to run a race. You don't have a bunch of stuff in your pockets and a bunch of things weighing you down. Get rid of sin out of your life. Push it out of your life. You know something's wrong. You know that it hurts you. Stop doing it. 
as I've said many times in different studies, um, I've had a problem with chocolate over the years. I eat chocolate, I get a headache. Well, you know, but I sure like the taste of chocolate now and then, and I eat another piece of chocolate, and I get another headache, and I eat another piece of chocolate, and I get another headache, and you know what? Finally, I just say, enough! Stop! I don't need to be walking around all day with this terrible, throbbing headache, and just stop eating the chocolate. Well, are you saying that chocolate will send me to hell, then? If that's the way your little mind thinks, then, you know, I can't help you. <laughs> no, of course not. There's a lot of things that might be bad for me, and it might not be a big deal for you. Whatever. You have to get it figured out. Personal relationship, you see, with Jesus Christ. He'll work things out for you personally. There might be certain types of music that cause you to sin that I could listen to and it doesn't do anything. And vice versa. Whatever. But the whole point is, brethren, you have to figure out what is sin in your life and you stop doing it. Go and sin no more. Well, that's not possible. You can't live sinless. Well, of course you can't be sinless. Right? I understand that. You can't never have any temptation to sin. But the whole point is every day you're fighting it. Fighting and fighting. You don't just say, well, I'm just going to mess around and do some things here and I'll just, you know, I enjoy the grace of God and, and whatever. Don't turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. You see? You understand? But let's go back through the list here. This is a true saying. If a man not woman, desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. I actually have one of these new versions down here in my collection, and it says if a person desires the office of a bishop, they desire a good work or something. <laughs> yeah, that's why you stick to the King James Bible, the Bible that God uses and blesses. A bishop then must be blameless. What? Blameless? Well, I thought you can't live without sin. Well, yeah, you can't live without the temptation of sin, without sinning occasionally. You mess up, but you get it corrected. You don't walk around with a bad, dirty bunch of skeletons in your closet. You get the skeletons out, you get rid of those, and you say, okay, I'm done. I'm going to get victory. If a man that claims to be a preacher or in ministry doesn't have victory over certain sins, then he has no spiritual power. I'll give you a little uh, thing here to think about. Right now, my son is reading this book right here about World War II. Yes, he's reading this book. And the other morning he's sitting here at his desk, you know, beside me working at my desk. And he's reading and he starts to say, oh, you know, Father, you aren't going to believe this. I won't turn to the page there, but he was telling me the stories about how in World War II, what the, the uh, drill instructors, the DIs, would do to these soldiers. If you were caught chewing gum, they would make you take the gum out and go like this and rub it in your hair. And you had to leave it there. That's a pretty bad punishment. If they caught you smoking at a place or whatever time where you weren't supposed to smoke, the DI would make you stand in front of all the other troops, stand at attention, and he'd put a cigarette in your mouth and he'd light it, and he'd say, okay, stand there and smoke it in front of all these troops, and he'd put a metal bucket over their heads. you imagine that in the modern military? <laughs> Metal bucket over the head, and you're in there, and all the smoke's going up in your eyes, and, and the heat of it and everything else. That would have been terrible. But I bet you it stopped that guy from smoking when he wasn't supposed to. They were given orders. No cookies, no care packages coming from your family when you're, you know, in certain combat zones or whatever else. Or not combat, I guess it was in basic training or something, because the DIs were still there. And if your mother sent you cookies, the drill instructor would make you stand out in front and he would humiliate you, and he would stand there and eat the cookies right in front of the guy, in front of the soldier. You know why? Because they're so hateful, and they, they hate people, and they're narrow-minded and bigoted. No, because he's trying to prepare you for combat. And what would it be like to have a drill instructor come out there, and he's got a big gut, and he's kind of, okay, everybody, we have to do some marching. I'll be riding in my golf cart behind you. Can that guy train you for combat? Get over there to the combat zone, war zone, and, and here's a guy, a commanding officer. <sighs> you know, I, I, I don't remember how this gun works, but you know, come on, follow me into battle. No, thank you. I don't want to die. You know what you look for in a real good military? I know the modern military is pretty much just corrupt and a bunch of woke you know, perverts and whatever else. There's probably still some decent guys in the military. Not saying they're all bad, but you know what I'm saying. If you're in the military or if you're a veteran, 
Uh, there's not many, the modern military you know, pales in comparison to what was going on back here, you know, when they actually had real men back in World War II. Um, you know what you want? You want a enlisted officer, or a, a, not enlisted, but a commissioned officer that has some experience. If he's a veteran of another war, you're going to stick real close to that guy. You want him to be blameless, a man of good moral character. That's what you want to follow in a time of combat. And I don't mean chasing around a bunch of you know, Arabs in a third world country either. I'm talking about European type war, white man against white man, like World War II, World War I. Those were the big wars you know, artillery and aircraft and, you know, naval battles and all the other, just fought in every possible way that they could. Just thinking and all the inventors going, we have to make the tank stronger. We have to make the guns bigger so it can destroy the other tank. We have to make the aircraft faster. We have to make them shoot better. Well, you know, let's maybe, could we make jet engines instead of just the propellers? And could we, you know, just thinking of better ways to kill each other. You want a good commander in combat. Well, if the military has those standards, shouldn't the body of Christ have better standards? Well, brother so-and-so, my preacher, you know, he's, he, he preaches a good sermon, but, you know, he, we drink out of the same bottle outside of church, you know, and you go out behind the thing and he's out there smoking his cigarettes and, and uh, he's, you know, boy, I, I heard this one joke from my preacher and it, huh? Well, you know, my pastor, he's, 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 he's a, he runs a ministry for broken people. Oh, we're all broken here. We all have sins, don't we? We all struggle with sins, don't we? And he doesn't have any victory in his life over certain sins. He just, he's, brethren, could you pray for me? I fell again. I've cheated on my wife again, and I'm going to be on my fifth marriage or something now. And yeah, you know. And my, my son, you know, he had to be put into drug rehab again. And, and my daughter, she's had her third child now to a different man. And But uh, let, let's turn in your Bible. I'll teach you the scripture. The church is a place for broken people. I remember I got into an argument with my oldest brother the one time about that. They had a pervert, a disgusting sex pervert in their church. And he had done some horrible, wicked thing. I don't remember what it was. And he said that the, a bunch of the older people were going to kick the guy out. And he said, no. He said, the church is where people are supposed to be. It's, it's the place for broken people. The church is where he needs to be. That's not what the Bible says. Kick them out. You're going to bring their leaven in here and try to leaven the whole lump? Take the morals down here, the moral character of this Military unit, that's what Christians are supposed to be. We're supposed to be called to be soldiers. We're fighting the enemy. Oh, well, let's bring in the leaven. Let's bring some sin into the camp so we can become less effective. You know the, why there's so much trouble right now in America? It's because the churches out there have tolerated sin for so long. They get these liberal churches. They actually promote sin. It's wonderful. It's great. They put the rainbow outside of the church. What the Bible condemns, they condone. Now it's seeping into, not now, it's been in the Baptist churches and in the King James only type of places and whatever else. They're the same as the liberals. They just wear a suit and tie instead of jeans and t-shirts and Hawaiian shirts and whatever else. It's foul. It's disgusting. And I've seen it for so many years. How the Baptists will just cover up for each other. Oh, let's not talk about that. Oh, yet yeah, we all have our sins. It, A bishop then must be blameless. When you get saved, there needs to be some supernatural victories over sin. There needs to be a change there. I've been harping on that for years. Oh, well, you just need to just believe and you don't have to have all this perfect sanctified. Yes, you do. If you're going to be in ministry, yes, you do. And if, you, if, you, if a man gets caught sinning, kick him out. If you catch me sinning, if any of you people come up here and you see me running around with some woman that's not my wife, like that would ever happen, you see me getting drunk, you see me in drugs or some other wicked sin like that, then you call me out, you expose me, and I will have to leave. The husband of one 
wife. Well, that means one living wife. Well, okay, yeah, a guy can get remarried if his wife dies. Sure, okay, fine. Well, it can also mean a one wife that's, you know, he can have other wives that are there that have been scripturally divorced. Uh, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I believe when it says the husband of one wife, I think it means that. Quite frankly. Because I've never seen a guy that has been married, divorced, remarried, and then he's a preacher. They start to compromise in all kinds of other areas. Ruckman did it. Uh, a lot of these guys. They don't have good marriages after their first marriage dissolves. And don't give me this thing, well, their wife, it was all her fault. It's 100% her fault. I've never seen that case either. I've seen divorces and remarriages and whatever else, but you get in, you get into that. I personally think I'm not going to question somebody's salvation that's remarried. Obviously, you can get into bad things and and whatever else you make mistakes, but you don't qualify for ministry. You want to get mad about that and get angry at me and whatever else? Well, whatever, I don't care. Um, but you know, for for many centuries, Christians uh, didn't divorce. Now all of a sudden, the divorce rate is the same as the lost world among Christians. That's a problem. That's a big problem. Vigilant. Are these church building hirelings, are they vigilant? Are they actually concerned with looking into a lot of different things and seeing what are the movements of the devil right now that are going to hurt the people under my care? I try to be as vigilant as I can. It gives you know a lot of people, hey, are you going to answer my letter? Could you please answer my letter? Um, I study, I research all the time. I mean, I literally, I don't think it's here right now. No, it's not. It's out in the kitchen um, here at the office. I have an MP3 player. I will come in and I will literally get videos that I need to watch. People send me links to and whatever else. And I will download the video unless it's really huge. I had a guy send me one of six hours and something or seven hours or whatever else. And he said, just look this little part here. Yeah, I can't download something that size. But if it's a you know, 15, 20 minutes, a half hour, an hour, I will download it as an audio file, an MP3, stick it on an MP3 player, and then while I'm doing other work around the house and things, cooking a meal or whatever else, uh, I'll listen to it. Just study, 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 study. Why? Because I want to be vigilant, sober, of good behavior. These aren't suggestions. These are things that you have to do. Again, you get some military officer uh, and he can't control himself and he goes out to bars and he gets drunk. How long is he going to be an officer? But the military should have those standards, but the body of Christ doesn't need the standards. <sighs> Disgusting. Given to hospitality, apt to teach. Um, a lot of people say, oh, you're a hermit and whatever else. No, actually, I'm given to hospitality. I like to talk to people. Um, I'd love to be able to have people and come here and meet with me and whatever else. And that'd be great. But this place is not conducive to people coming. I mean, we don't have running water and the whole thing here. And uh, I don't want to hook up to the town water is the whole issue. And there's a bunch of other stuff. There's plumbing issues at this place that we weren't aware of when we first bought it. Uh, and I'm not going to spend the money on it because I don't know what the Lord wants for us in the future. But if we can have a place eventually where I can meet with people publicly and they can come absolutely and that the thing of apt to teach again i look at these things and i strive for these i'm lacking here and i'm lacking there and but i want to get better at that so i need to work harder at you know these things i'm very much concerned with pleasing god with my life and not just faking my way through the ministry but i try to be apt to teach i want to teach the word of god and this is the most effective way to do it here in the 21st century if I, had, I mean, there's only a few hundred people that even live in the area where I'm at. If I had a church building, I would offend most of the people in the area. <laughs> uh, let's just be straight about that. There's a few people in the area that are, you know, fans of the ministry that watch the ministry. I've met a few of them, uh, praise the Lord. But uh, most of the people would be ticked off at me in this area with what I preach and what I teach. So how do I get through to people? Move to a bigger city or something like that? Well, that's not really going to happen. I'm not raising my son in a city environment. So what's the best thing? YouTube. Um, or Rumble or whatever else in the future. Not given to wine. Uh, I can't stand the taste of wine. 
I'll be honest. I I thought for a little while. I thought the thing of, of uh, you know, uh, using you know, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. You know, Paul writes to tell, to Timothy, and I thought, well, you know, uh, wine is a fermented beverage, and I thought if there's good bacteria, probiotics, and things in it, if I can find something that's very high quality, that would be sort of an organic wine or whatever. Maybe it would help me with some of my digestive issues. Maybe it would help with health, and I couldn't find anything. I tried a bunch of different types of wine, just taking little bits of it, and it just, ugh, I can't stand the taste of this stuff. It tastes like cough syrup. I hate it. <laughs> I just thought, no, you know, alcohol has never been a problem for me. Why? Well, because, number one, I had an uncle growing up, my mother's brother, and I saw him destroy his life, uh, his really good wife that he was married to. Uh, she left him because of his alcohol problems. That made an impression on me as a child. He came the one time and he was drunk, I remember, and my father, you know, get out of here and everything. That was issue number one that really burned into my brain here. And uh, the second thing was my father was an uh, EMT or whatever, paramedic, I forget what it was, for I think 25 years. And he'd come home and he'd tell us these stories about drunk driving accidents and the horrible things that he saw. And that made an impression on me. And I remember in high school, I'd go hang out with my friends, you know, and and um, and I, you know, I'd be at their house, and they'd start breaking out the alcohol, and I'd say, "Okay, time for me to go. I have to leave." Hey, man, you want a drink? No, you're stupid. I'm not drinking any of that garbage. No. And I've always been very strong against the thing of alcohol, and I realize now, early on, that was the Lord's uh, grace for me, and the Lord put that in my mind, even though I was a false convert. Um, he was preparing me for what I am now. There's another thing he was preparing me for, and I'll talk about that here in a couple minutes. But let's continue with the thing here, but not given to wine. You say, well, they could drink a little tiny bit of wine. And what, well, you're getting into some temptation stuff there. It's better just not to drink it. No striker. In other words, you're not just ready to fight people and beat people up all the time. Uh, again, I'm very calm with that. It takes a lot to get me angry. And uh, for me to become to the point where I would get physical with somebody, it would take a whole lot. Not greedy of filthy lucre. This channel has never been monetized. I do not sell out to the world. On um, the body of Christ, I mean, you can you can send money to the ministry here, or you don't have to send money to the ministry here. Whatever. You say, what about your book? I think I've made probably a couple hundred dollars, in all honesty. It, it's barely anything. I mean, I get check, checks from, or a PayPal thing from uh, Lulu, that's the publisher of my book, and it's you know eighteen dollars or something, eighteen dollars and thirty two cents. I think was the last one that I got in. I'm not getting wealthy from that. So greedy of filthy lucre? No, I can look at that one. I can say yeah, I'm not greedy of filthy lucre. Um, patient. <laughs> I'm not real patient sometimes. That's a hard one for me. That's one I look at and I say okay, you know, not, not doing so good on the checklist here, Brian. Not a brawler. Uh, well, I have somewhat of a fighting spirit about me. Um, I have a tendency to try to, you know, get into the comments and start, you know, railing on people and beating them up and whatever. Um, it goes along with the thing of patience. Um, again, I have to work on that. Trying to calm down, try to, you know, understand. Again, one of the one of my faults, to put it out there, is thinking that I have to be able to convert people's minds and not understanding that there are some people that you just can't help and you just have to walk away from. Don't let it get to you and whatever else and just, okay, whatever, you know, walk away. But, you know, it's, you know, but they said this and I can get, you know, look, it's not right. I need to just learn to walk away from things. Confessing my faults. Um, not covetous. I don't want any of the things that Kenneth Copeland has. People compare me to Benny Hinn or Kenneth Copeland. Oh, he's in it for the money. <laughs> okay, uh, I've lived without running water since 2018. All right, uh, I don't think I'm some kind of a huge, big money guy and whatever else. Um, well, you have all properties and things. Lots of properties and lots of vehicles or whatever. I get this one too. It's a bunch of junky vehicles that I'm, you know, if you don't understand, I'll probably do a video on this in the future just to teach younger men about, you know, why to have multiple vehicles. Um, I could go out and I could spend $50,000 on a vehicle, get myself into debt doing that, or I can buy older vehicles that are, I have to keep them working and whatever else. 
that's just the way that things are. You live out in the countryside, if you have one vehicle and it breaks down, you can't exactly hail a cab or something, hey, you know, taxi or something, or go down to the local bus stop. There aren't anything, there's nothing like that in this area. So just to say that, um, that's one of the reasons I have multiple vehicles. I have a plow truck at home that needs a battery right now and has a power steering leak, and I use it to plow the lane in the winter. That's all I use it for. Could I drive it here and drive it around and things? Yes, as long as there's no police there, you know, that day because it's been out of inspection for years now. But that's one vehicle. I have my Jeep. That's the vehicle that I go around in the wintertime. But to drive on the highway, it has the death, a little bit of a death wobble when you get to a certain, you know, speed because it's got a lift kit on it, which is useful for going off road, but it's not so useful for traveling on the highway. So I have a car for traveling on the highway that I can still drive around, but you know, it's better um, than driving my Jeep. And then I have a vehicle that I can use to work. Oh, you're so covetous and whatever. Uh, you don't understand. Uh, city people don't judge us at the, that live out here in the country, and we have a couple of vehicles. All right, there's each one has a different purpose, and if you add them all up, it's still less than the cost of a brand new vehicle. So you know, and as far as the house and my land that I own, plans have changed. Right, it's not some kind of a thing where I just wasted money and thrown money out. I'm going to make my money back and then some. I'll probably triple what I paid for my property when I eventually sell it. All right, plans have changed. And it's where I live, you know? So it just, it boggles my mind how people could say that you're being covetous. Brian Denlinger's covetous. I'm not covetous. Just to clear up some of the stuff because I see these attacks over and over again. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. That's a, a struggle every day. I have to discipline my son. Every day. Stop doing that. Don't pout. Don't get whiny on me and things. Hey, stop running. Don't knock that thing over. Stop. Come on over here. It's time for you to read. You need to sit there and you need to read. Be quiet. I'm doing my work here. Oh, Father, can we look at that video? No, you need to spend your time reading. Okay, say that word correctly. You know, he has a little bit of a lisp and things. We work on it every day, every day. He's gotten a lot of his words are a lot better than they once were. That's just the way it is. You raise the child that way. He reads the Bible on his own. He's learning a lot of things. He studies. He builds things with his hands. He likes to deconstruct things. That's one of his favorite things to do. There was an um, a old remote control car, and it was just a car. It didn't have the little remote thing when we came here, and he just deconstructed it the other day. And you know what he said? Honestly, I came in. He's got the thing... And there's still a spring laying over there. I told him to clean it up. But uh, he's got this thing completely taken apart. He's taking the screws out and he's taking the little electric motor apart, taking the wheels off and everything. And I came in and I said, what are you doing? He's taking this car apart. And he said, I decided that I need to put away childish things. <laughs> Honestly, it's what he said. It was such a blessing to see that. And he said, I don't want this thing anymore. He said, I want to be able to grow up and, and do you know, spend my time more wisely. Wow, praise the Lord. That takes years to do that. And we go out to places and, and whatever else, and I have people coming up all the time. Your son is so good. I can't believe it. I didn't even know he was standing there. He was just quiet, and he was listening to us and, and things. Went to a meeting of local people against Wolfton, and my son just sitting there quietly, and afterwards people coming up and saying, I can't believe he's just sitting there just so quiet. Such a well-behaved child. So I can look at this list and I can say, okay, having you know, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. That's good. Again, well, yeah, I know a pastor and yeah, his children are really rambunctious and whatever else. I knew a pastor the one time um, that uh, his son was a drug addict and his daughter was, you know, basically dressing like a prostitute and fornicating with different, you know, people out there but well, he was a good pastor so you know what his children do it's, it shouldn't affect him and uh, no actually it should and if he doesn't qualify for that then you kick him out for if a man know not how to rule his own house how shall he take care of the church of god if i had a, a terrible wife stepping out on me all the time and doing all kinds of horrible things um and she's completely loyal to me as well by the way um, 
she wouldn't even think about cheating on me. We love each other. We're best friends. I thank the Lord for that. It took long enough for the Lord to bring her into my life. You know, I was 36 when I married her, but that's another issue. But um, if I can't rule over my own home, then what right do I have to stand here and preach to you? You say, well, we can't check into you and whatever. Oh, you can check into what we are and what we do. You know, there's people in the area that see us and they see how we act out in public and whatever else. You know, I mean, we have our arguments. We don't, we're not perfect in terms of we just get along all the time and everything's just sunshine and roses or something. No, uh, we do have our arguments, but we're never going to leave the Lord, ever. And if we do, then we don't qualify, or I don't qualify for ministry. If my wife leaves me or my son turns out to be rotten or whatever else, then I need to step down. And a real man of God will step down. Again, I've told this story before, but I remember when I was growing up, Calvary Monument Bible Church, uh, Brian Boykin was the pastor's name, and he literally committed adultery, cheated on his wife, and I remember that Sunday he got up, and he got up there with his wife. They're standing up in the pulpit, you know, the raised pulpit up there in front of everybody. And he said, I need to confess a, a sin that I committed. He said, I was unfaithful to my wife. I committed adultery and uh, I no longer qualify for the ministry. She has chosen to forgive me and I pray that you will all forgive me as well. But I'm not qualified to be a pastor. So I'm leaving right now. And he walked down from the pulpit and they walked out the door. And that was it. That's a real man. A real man with character. Not, you know, well, I, I, okay, I do cheat on my wife and whatever else, but she's, you know, got her own thing going there, and let's just kind of keep it quiet. Oh, some guys at church caught me, but, you know, we'll just kind of cover this up and whatever else. And by the way, that same church also was, they, they were covering up other sins, there was actually sodomy among some of the youth, but the families that the sodomy was involved with or whatever, they were bigger tithers in the church. So they just kind of, let's not talk about that. There's so much sin in these church buildings. And I'm talking back in the 1980s, okay, back when I was little. Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. You can't be a novice. You have to go through some things. You have to qualify for the ministry. And like I said, I, I can look at this list and I can say, you know, I, I don't really even qualify in every single thing perfectly. I'm trying. I'm striving for it. But uh, it's a very high calling to be a bishop, an elder within the church. And we need to have those high standards. Verse 7, Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Um, see, here's the worst part about it. If you don't have a good report of them which are without, you will fall into condemnation. Remember what Jesus said earlier there in Luke chapter 12, verses 1 through 5? The things that are done in secret are going to be published on the housetop. The things, oh, nobody knows about this, we'll cover this up. The Lord brings it to light. The Lord will, will reveal that. You bring, are brought into condemnation and the snare of the devil. Knew a pastor years ago, um, Dr. Arnold Killinger, Cornerstone Baptist Church, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. I was in his office, sat there with him. We talked for hours about the Bible version issue and things. He had me teach an adult Sunday school class on the Bible version issue. And towards the end of it, he went off. The, the deacon was a new version guy, and he went off about you know, the King James Bible is not inspired. We just need to make that clear. And he basically destroyed what I was trying to say, trying to teach people faith in the King James Bible. You can trust this book right here. You don't need all the Greek and the Hebrew and everything else. And he destroyed that, completely destroyed it. And it started to shake some things up at the church building there. I left and I said, I'm done. I'm not going to be here with people that don't even believe in the book that they preach from. And that same preacher, a PhD, seven years, Tennessee Temple, and um, he went and he had to get a job because people were leaving uh, his church there. He couldn't, you know, have full-time income anymore from there. So he was working at a job and he basically, there were two women that he was working with. There are two of the women that were working there. I'll say it that way. I think it was more than just three employees, but those two women, he went to them and he said, 
I'd like to have uh, essentially an orgy with the two of you and me. Married man with children and adopted children. PhD, the whole thing. You know what they did? Thankfully, they kicked him out of the church when they found out. Out you go. He got divorced, and the last time I saw him, I was driving my, I had a Ford Ranger years ago with uh, bumper magnets on it and everything else. If you died tonight, would you be in heaven or hell on the one thing? And believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, now shall be saved. Over on the other side, and you know my website address in between the two. He was in his vehicle, this little uh, Ford Fiesta or something, or Geo Metro or something, you know, 1990s, early 90s car, late 80s, early, you know, whatever. If you don't know what those cars are, you can look it up. And I remember he's driving and he's just, this nasty little look following me. I don't know if he knew it was me or not. I have no idea. But just living in some dingy little apartment someplace. Ruined his life. He didn't have a, a good report of them which are without. He fell into reproach and the snare of the devil. He was condemned. Condemnation of the devil. And he wasn't a novice either. Uh, he was very well educated, but still ruined him. Um, another way to say that, we'll get to this here in just a little bit, but the thing of being turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Let's go next to Titus chapter 1. I mean, you know, you get into the military. Uh, I've studied a lot about the military over the years. I like to read books from soldiers, guys that have gone through war and combat and everything else. I've read quite a few of those. And uh, you get an officer that starts to mess around. Um, that can turn out very bad. I remember the, uh, the one guy from the opposite end here, a Nazi officer. And uh, I can't remember what the guy's name was, but he was, he was for Germany and he was not for Hitler. And he was actually part of the plot to blow up Hitler. And he was the one that brought the suitcase in with the explosives in, put it underneath the table. And I mean, the guy was a war hero, a very tough soldier, very strong soldier and everything else. But uh, he went against the Nazi high command. The bomb went off and whatever else, and they found who the conspirators were. And um, they took the guy out in the in the yard and they shot him. And say, well, yeah, everybody makes mistakes. And hey, the Nazi party is for, for broken soldiers. Uh, they took him out and they shot him. Sorry, we have to do this, sir. Long live Germany. Why? You can't have a guy like that in there. The Nazi high command was bad for Germany, and that's why he was fighting against it. But the whole thing is, the Nazi high command, they were in charge. And that guy just committed treason. Take him out and shoot him. Firing squad. But we should have less standards. <laughs> just absolutely blows my mind. Brethren, I don't understand a lot of this stuff. I really, I mean, I understand it, but I don't understand it. You know, it's kind of like the Lord marveling at their unbelief. Well, he understood that they don't believe, but he's marveling at it. You just think, <laughs> it's just right there. It's I, The Bible's so clear. There are standards for men in ministry. If the standards are not met, you kick them out. Go away. Well, I don't know. I think we should probably just leave this snake in this position. And yeah, Okay, he's been caught with fornication. Okay, he's been divorced and remarried a few times. Okay, you know, yeah, there's some money issues here. He's stealing some money and he's not telling the truth. And it, But we all make mistakes. Titus chapter 1, verse 6 through 16. If any be blameless, there it is again, the husband of one wife having faithful children not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless. You see, it's not possible. You, you, yes, it is. Okay, understand the difference between sinless, sinless perfection means that you don't ever make any mistakes. That's not what the Bible's talking about here. When you're blameless, it means you make a mistake, but you correct it as quickly as possible. You're constantly examining yourself, making sure that you're right with God, a life of repentance. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. I had that thought. Oh, man. Oh, I got that stupid song in my head. Oh, Lord, please help me with that. 
and you live like that, you will be blameless. When you're blamed, it's because you did something wrong and you didn't ask forgiveness for it. And somebody can then blame you. Okay, please understand that. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy, not given to filthy lucre, excuse me, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. That's my job. That's what I'm supposed to do. I have to hold fast the faithful word. I'm holding it. You're not taking it from me. I'm not going to all of a sudden show up and I'll, you know, have my face shaved and, and wearing a, you know, t-shirt or some kind of, you know, hip looking clothes or something. And I use in the message now. Or, <laughs> no, that's not going to happen. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. Many in the first century. But now in the last days where we're at right now, when some shall depart from the faith. The time will come when they will not give heed to you know, sound doctrine. They'll give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. But there won't be vain talkers and deceivers now. Uh, yes, there will be. The vast majority are. Especially they of the circumcision, the Jews, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. These people will subvert whole houses. I cannot tell you how many times I've lost faithful viewers that loved me and supported the ministry and whatever, and all of a sudden they just go, Phew, off they go, because they didn't take heed to what I've warned them about. See, my job is to say to you, I have studied this issue and I've studied that issue, and you can get into all the debate stuff, back and forth, all this Alexandrian stuff, you know, the, the naturalistic textual criticism, and, and you get into the Greek thing and, and Strong's concordance, and the Greek doesn't quite line up with the Greek. of The word should be better translated as it. I've studied all that stuff. I've read a lot of books on the issue. If you're going to get into it, you have to be very careful. The safest thing that you can do is just understand for men with experience, this is the Bible right here, the King James Bible. You don't have to waste your time getting into all the Greek and all, well, this variant reading could be better translated. Don't waste your time with it. Just put this book to the test. Live according to the pages of the King James Bible and see the Holy Spirit power in your life. Trust me, but I've had so many. Well, you know, I... I got James White's book and I started to have some doubts put in my mind. Yeah, that's his job. He works for Satan. All right? That's what the guy is supposed to do. Put doubts into people's minds. But, well, I started to listen to him and I'm starting to have some doubts about the King James Bible. And, well, I, you know, I started to listen to some people that get into the Hebrew roots of the scriptures and, and I don't think we should say Jesus anymore. I think it should be Yeshua and then you go to Yahashua and then Yahawashi and then Lord only knows what other things. Oh yeah, I, I was starting to watch some videos on YouTube, brother, and 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 I started. To, I'm having some questions about the you know, hell being eternal fire and torment, and I don't really know if that's true. And I'm starting to worry about. You know, I think we're going to go into the great tribulation, and I, I don't know, brother. I'm thinking. Listen to me. I've done the hard stuff. I've done the work. You know, and I'm getting a little frustrated with people. You know. You don't know about the rapture issue. Yeah, just 160 uh, sermons, videos, and things. Yeah, I don't know about the issue. Well, I'm just an idiot, I guess. You know, well, you haven't studied it properly. <laughs> okay, uh, yes, I have. Yeah, well, I've been saved for two years. I don't think you know what you're talking about, Denlinger. Okay, then here's what you can do. Go on out into combat and try it for yourself. Go ahead. Go on out there into the battlefield and just go on about your way. No commanding officer over you. No man that's got some experience to tell you, hey, watch out for that. Watch it. Hey, there, that mound over there, I, that's a landmine. I know that just as sure as, oh, you don't know what you're talking about, Denlinger. I go wherever I want. I'm warning you, that's a landmine. I have have lots of experience. I know how they put those landmines in the ground like that. You better not walk that way. Shut up, Denlinger. Who are you? You're in this for the money, blah, 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 blah. Boom! Ah, medic, medic! He's over there, legs blown off. Tried to warn you, but you're so smart, you, you know better than me.
I've seen it so many times. I've seen it many, many times. I'm not saying that you have to listen to me. I'm your holy pope or something. I never make mistakes. But uh, you should listen to a lot of what I say. <laughs> Check it with the scriptures. A lot of you correct me in the comments. You say, actually, brother, you misquoted that. That's, it should have been this way or whatever. Thank you. Thank you for the correction. You're right. And I'll say that in the comments. How many other preachers do that same thing, by the way? Most don't. They won't admit to making a mistake. But uh, you better listen to some of the stuff I've preached about. You don't know more than me. If you've only been saved just a little tiny bit of time, you better learn that there is some authority here in the scriptures and a man of God that has to follow these scriptures. Um, I'm held to a very high standard. And I greatly fear what would happen to me if I would walk away from the standards of scripture. I don't want to end up like the pastors I've known that have fallen and that are living horrible, little, miserable lives now. That, that scares me. I don't want to do that. Um, verse 10. For there are many... Well, we already went over that one. Verse 11. Whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. We went over that one too. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. I'm supposed to rebuke not only false prophets and whatever else, but men that are in ministry that shouldn't be in ministry. I will rebuke them sharply. I, I found it absolutely repulsive to see these guys um, covering up for men that they know are in sin. Oh, brother, well, you know, let's just kind of take it easy and whatever else. I'm going to bring out a video in the future showing Peter Ruckman, one of his sermons, one of his chalk talks. And he goes off on this big rant about Jack Hiles and people come to me and say, oh, brother Hiles is doing this, brother Hiles is doing that. Yeah, well, you know, if God knew everything or if we knew everything about you that God knows about you, we'd be pretty shocked too. That's not how you handle it. Okay. You say, really? Well, what's your proof? Do you have two or three witnesses against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses? Um, then that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. You see, America, one of America's big problems, this is a, going to be going off on a lot of little tangents today, but just deal with me. One of America's biggest problems is they try to stop crime before it happens. That doesn't work. Let's take away the guns so that we can prevent crime. That doesn't work. What you do is you increase the punishment for the crime that's been committed. Okay? What would happen if they said, hey, you want to be a gangbanger? Go out there holding your gun sideways and all this stuff? You want to be that? And you want to go shoot people up, do drive-by shooting? And, okay, when we catch you, we're going to hang you in the public square. Public execution. I don't mean torture. Hang them. Public execution. There's a dead body swinging. Children, people walking by and looking. What, what was that guy's crime? Oh, he used a gun in violence. He went out and killed somebody. Well, we should get rid of guns so it doesn't happen again. No, that's the deterrent to crime right there. Hey, Pastor so-and-so, this man, that man, the guy's a raving pervert. He was caught. There are police records on this guy. Multiple witnesses have come forward. More than two or three witnesses have come forward and they're accusing this guy. They're saying he's wicked. He's bad. Every preacher in the nation should be coming out and saying, that man needs to be de to delivered to, the, to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Kick him out of the ministry. Out you go. And you know what? The lost people would respect us more if we did it. Hey, you know something? You lost people out there. I know a lot of you watch me. You know what you need? You need to see a ministry where you can feel safe. You'd feel safe bringing your wife here. You'd feel safe dropping your children off at this place. Hey, Brian, Brian's a, a bit of an idiot in some things, and he says some things that's a little bit offensive, and he doesn't always say his speech right, but I know one thing. That man has moral character, and I could trust him with my wife and children, and he wouldn't touch them. Some guy bring his wife here. I wouldn't even be in the same room as her. I'd say, okay, you're going to go be with my wife or something. Just go over that way. Uh, it's not appropriate for me to be with her. I'm not going to do it. 
some guy would say hi after I, I mean some kind of issue or whatever could I please have my wife stay here you know just for a few hours or something like that absolutely if my wife is here yes if my wife isn't here no honestly honestly that would be my standard children come my wife and I will be present and my son and we'll take the children and, and we'll have fun and things like that. Maybe play a game or whatever else or go for a hike in the woods or something. I'm not going to mess with them. Years ago, I knew a, a couple and they said uh, their two sons were taking me out in the woods. My wife and I, and we were going out and, you know, we had guns and we were going out looking for, you know, whatever varmints to shoot or whatever. It was hunting season. And he said, it came back and he said, um, brother, he said, I just wanted to say to you that, uh, you're one of the very few men in this, in this world that I actually trust to leave alone with my sons. And I said, thank you. I appreciate that. People that know me know that I have moral character. I don't always do things right. I make mistakes, but I'm supposed to have moral character. Why? Because I am in ministry and I have to be held to a higher standard. And if I ever fall from those standards, kick me out of the ministry. Say, okay. No more. Ever comes out that uh, I'm a liar or a deceiver or something. Some woman comes forward and says, yeah, here's the proof. I can prove that he's been with me or something. Or some drug, drug dealer comes out and says, yeah, Denlinger buys from me all the time or whatever. My health has been so poor in the past and I, I try so hard with natural health to get my health back. You know, I mean, I have a heart condition. I have a lot of other things wrong with me. I'd be stupid to go with, with drugs or alcohol or cigarettes or something like that. It'd kill me that much quicker. <laughs> you know, so again, I can't get into that stuff. But if I did, don't you dare send another donation. And you stop watching me. Unsubscribe, go away. See, that guy's a fraud. See? I'm not going to hold up myself to something of, you should just be okay with me living in sin, because after all, we all sin. No, that's not what the New Testament teaches. Verse 14, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Uh, that's the unbelieving. Their mind and conscience is defiled. And I've seen some of these... Pastors, pastors, you know, Dirty Donnie Romero, you know, from the new IFB, Baptist pastor. And, oh, he'd stand up there and he railed against Brian Denlinger. He used to attack me in some of his sermons. He would attack me and whatever else. Yeah, it turned out the guy was gambling, doing meth, and messing with prostitutes, hiring prostitutes. Married man with children. Baptist preacher. Finally got caught and he got up there and he's reading his cell phone. I'm so sorry, guys. I can't do this anymore. <laughs> Walks away. And Stephen Anderson comes up, oh, okay, I'm, I'm appointing a new pastor here. <laughs> Not the local church, you know, but the, the, you know, Pope there of the new IFB. That whole system fell apart. And again, Stephen Anderson, uh, it came out that his boys were messing around, texting horrible, vile, sodomite type of stuff back and forth with each other. Didn't have his own children in subjection. Kick him out. <laughs> Verse 16, it proves that they're lost. They go, this sin, they just covered up for years and years. Verse 16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. They do good works, but there's a reprobate reason for it. They're doing it for their own financial gain. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. There's no true changed life. Look out for any preacher, by the way, that preaches against having a changed life. If there's not supernatural things that happen in your life, if you're not a different man or different woman, you know, because it applies to all Christians, it's not just for preachers, but uh, there needs to be some supernatural things happening in your life where the Lord gives you victory over certain sins. And it's just like a, a switch. When the Lord gives you victory over a sin, if you've never had this happen, if you're just brand new saved, the Lord will give you victory over certain sins and it's like a, a switch, like a light switch, just flip. And you go from just... I can't get rid of this to just boom and it's over. And you might have other struggles in other areas that you have to work on, but the whole thing is, brethren, it's like a checklist. And my son studies airplanes all the time, so I, you know, I, I study with him, so this stuff gets in my head. But you go through the checklist. 
commercial pilot. He's going through and he's saying, okay, did I check the tires? Yeah, the tires look good. Did I check the brakes? Yes. Did I check the hydraulic lines? Yes. Did I check to see if there's any fuel leaks? Did I check this? Did I check that? Did I check? Check, 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 check. Well, that sounds awfully strict. That sounds like such a, a legalistic type of life. Um, or it sounds like a safe flight where you don't crash and burn. I better say that one more time. It sounds like a safe flight where you don't crash and burn. You want to have a safe life as a Christian? A life where God can bless you? A life where God can use you? And you don't want to crash and burn? Then you better go through the checklist. God, what am I supposed to do? I'm a Christian lady. Look through there. Am I doing that? Check. Yeah, I'm doing that one. What about this one? You're not so good. Uh, I need to work on that one. But I, I, I am on a certain level, but I need to get better at that. Christian man, go through. Check. Check. Uh, I need to work on that. Go through the checklist so you don't crash and burn. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll see how Paul handles a pervert in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. It is reported commonly, good report of them that are without, them that are without now are looking, they're seeing. Look at this. Look at what's going on. That's a problem when it gets to that point. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. I know, heard this, you know, talked about years ago. Uh, it's not even named among the Gentiles back there in the first century. Boy, how we are have fallen, how things have gotten so much worse over the years. Now it's called a mother, and then the F word. It's named. It's part of normal speech for a lot of people. But back then, in the first century, it wasn't even named. And it doesn't mean necessarily the guy was messing with his birth mother. It could have just been his father's second wife or something, his stepmother. But it was a wicked sin. And so, what does Paul say? Verse 2. And you need to realize that we are all broken. We're all sinners. Let's not judge one another. Let's all just come together... And ye are puffed up. That's the problem. And have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. You know, when I found out about this whole thing about Jeff Grider, um, first time, I, you know, years ago, I've talked about this in my other little video I did about this Jeff Grider guy. And, um, and I was, you know, trying to promote him. And, I, you know, he was in my comments section and he was commenting on my videos and, and whatever. And I thought, wow, it's neat. He's got this big website and everything. And this is great. And I was linking to his articles and things and early on. And a couple women came and they said, um, Brother Brian, uh, you need to stay away from the guy. He's a pervert. Uh, he was going after women at our church and they kicked him out and, and whatever. And I thought, well, okay. And, you know, you kind of go, uh, I don't know. And then a couple more came, and, and then it was a couple more, and I'm thinking, and I confronted him. I said, hey, what's going on? And went to him privately. Yeah, well, I had some problems, but they're just not willing to forgive me for it. And I just kind of went, eh, okay, well, um, uh, and I just departed, just uh, now the end begins, uh, whatever. I don't even mess with him or whatever else. And, and I just kind of just stayed away from it. And now that this whole big controversy came out, um, I mean, the guy during his time in ministry, he took his cell phone and he was filming a woman performing oral down yonder. And uh, I don't even want to say the words. I'm, I'm uh, that clean. Yeah, I'm that uh, much of a goody two shoes. Filming that and then he, he later tries to use it against her to bribe her when he was drunk. Police records proving it. Okay. Um, it's not a hearsay or, or gossip or whatever else. It's not gossip. It's reports that are coming out. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. Is, is Paul gossiping there? All you stupid people out there that have charged me with gossip? No. Paul's saying there's a problem here. And you know what's going on? You're puffed up. You're not mourning. You know what I feel when I hear of another Baptist pastor falling, another guy that uses the King James Bible or something, be they Baptist or conservative Methodist or whatever, non-denominational? You know what? It makes me mourn. I just go, 
Oh no. <sighs> Great. We have another one of these in the midst. There, it makes us look more foolish. It weakens us. There's sin in the camp. But you're puffed up. Oh, well, you know, I don't think we should kick him out. I mean, we all have our issues. It's not what the scripture says. He that hath done this deed might be taken away from among, among you. That's the solution. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present, concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. A saved man. You don't get the spirit saved in the day of the Lord Jesus if he's lost. This man's saved. And Paul's saying, you don't just take him and say, Look, we need to go through counseling now. And You say, get out of here. Go out on the street and I hope the devil kills you. Boy, things would be different if Christianity was that way today. Get out. We want to have a strong presence. We don't want sin coming in here. We want this to be a safe place where you can come. The body of Christ comes together and meets together. We don't want to have child molesters and sex perverts and this guy's fornicating and these, this guy's making eyes at this woman here and whatever. Again, I used to go to Lampeter United Methodist Church, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. I will name names. I always have and I always will. And there was literally two couples up front. Okay? Husband and wife, husband and wife. And they were there like that and within a week or two or whatever else, the same couples were up front but they had swapped wives. I kid you not. This woman went with that guy, and that guy's, you know, wife went with this guy. And everybody just kind of, well, you know, we can't say anything. Kick them out. You bunch of perverts, get out of here. Well, I'm genuinely saved. I just made a mistake. Okay, then the spirit can be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus, but I hope the devil kills you. Get them out of here. I'd like to see America with a real military again, with real men. I don't know how you can get these Gen Zers or whatever else to be real men, but, uh, you know, come up with some kind of training or something like that. Um, I'd like to see real military with real standards where the drill instructors can be creative with their, you know, uh, punishments and things of the new recruits, get them to be disciplined, strong soldiers. That'd be great. Is it going to happen? Probably not. But you need to increase righteousness. You know, instead of uh, getting in the recruits' faces and cussing them out and whatever else and making them say dirty things and filthy things, um, maybe there should be some righteous standards there. You know, back when our military, back World War I and World War II, when they would actually give out King James Bibles to the recruits and encourage them to read those Bibles, you know, that's why there was a, a lot of heroic men in World War One and World War Two, but then you know after that, well, let's just talk some dirty stuff and whatever, and the military starts to go down. We stop winning wars. A lot more cowards. God's laws apply. Verse four, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you okay, I already went over that. Um, verse six, okay. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Just a little bit of sin in the body of Christ. A little bit in there. And you're not mourning. You're puffed up and saying, well, you know, hey, well, you know, who am I to judge? And you, you do that. And you leaven the whole lump. Everything gets messed up. A little bit of sin in your life is always negative. God never condemns any good thing and calls it sin. Everything that's sin in this book here, it's all negative for you. You know, that's what's wrong with Roman Catholicism right now. You know, I would actually have more respect for Roman Catholicism as my enemy if they actually had things together. It just cracks me up. These Catholics, they'll come out and they'll say, well, look at you with your 30,000 Protestant denominations and all the division and everything. Yeah, how's your Catholic Church doing with the fights between the Latin Mass and the you know, speaking it in the language of the people. 
Yeah, tell me about that. Tell me about the Pope over there with these weird, bizarre shows and, and women with these purple outfits on and eyeballs there, you know, where they shouldn't be and things. And doing all these bizarre things and clowns dancing for the Pope and the Pope. <laughs> the Jesuit Pope. Tell me how things are going there where your Pope is saying that uh, abortion is a mortal sin over here, but if it's in certain things it can be injected, then it's okay. You know, virus is cultured on it. You tell me about the, the unity and the strength of your Catholic Church. It's fallen apart. A lot of leaven. That's leaven the whole lump, in other words. Verse 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. I, my prayer, brethren, is that things get so rough that it purges out all the false converts. And we just start knocking them out of the way. You want to be here as a pretender? You don't belong anymore. I want to raise the standards up, not bring them down. To make lost people feel comfortable in church. <laughs> you know, How can we make church better for the unchurched? It's insanity. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Are you sincerely believing this book? Are you sincerely going to live by this book? Now look at this, verse 9. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. You will be dealing with lost people out there. You can expect them to be sinners. You can expect them to have poor moral poor moral quality. All right? Fine, yeah, that's there. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one know not to eat. Kick them out. Get them out of here. There's some leaven in here. Get it and throw it out. Say Satan's outside. Oh, the, the devil's got it. He's encircled the, the place here the, where the church is meeting and whatever. He's out there. He's, he's ready. He's like a lion just walking about you know, wanting to eat something. Hey, is anybody in here with sin? You. You were caught doing this. You were caught fornicating. You're caught being drunk. You're covetous. You're an idolater. Get him. Throw him outside. But there's a lion out there. What happens if he goes out? The lion could eat him. That's exactly the point. Throw him out. And you hear the guy out there, like that. Look out there, the guy's being eaten alive by the lion, screaming. Okay, is there any sin, other sins in here that we need to know about? Wouldn't it be something if we had a purge of the government here in America? Martial or a military coup takes over and we'd actually have some real men in the military that would be able to do this. And they'd come in and they'd say, okay, um, how many of you in, in here have taken money from the Chinese Communist Party? Let's check into the checking accounts. Okay, oh, you you have, take him outside. That one, oh, she has as well. You know, take her out there. Oh, by the way, women, we don't want you in here. You know, you go out. We need to have men politicians again so we can have the blessing of God. Um, how many of you in here have taken money from Big Pharma? How many of you in here have done this and done that and extortion and whatever else and you're hiring prostitutes and whatever? We want to have a righteous government, so... It'd pretty much be everybody I think would have to be going outside, but just to try to prove a point here. And you take all these wicked sinners outside and everybody else that's left in there, and all of a sudden you hear, fire! And the, the remaining congressmen and senators walk over to the windows and look out. And there's a whole bunch of dead bodies out there and soldiers reloading. Uh, hey, you guys ready to go back into the halls of Congress and get some good laws passed? Yes. <laughs> uh, we'd have a good nation then. You can't just say that, you know, morals and, and things, good things just kind of come automatically and we don't have to have any kind of standards. We don't have to punish wickedness. You know, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's been some theft in the stores, but we can just kind of look the other way because after all, you know, 
people can wear masks coming into stores now because it's been legalized, you know, and we shouldn't look bad up upon people that are still worried about things floating in, in the air and whatever else that can't be stopped by masks anyhow. But, you know, we won't get into that. And look at the crime increasing. But it'll take care of itself. Don't worry. Don't worry. You know, I think the problem is that people can still defend themselves with firearms. So if we take away the guns, then crime will stop. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. If you got devils in you. Um, verse 12. For what have I to do to judge them that are also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without God judgeth. God will bring all this stuff together. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. It's exactly how it needs to be. Put away from among yourselves that wicked person. You know, and I, I want to tell this other uh, little story here real quickly. Um, just another little thing about my personal life, my past, uh, which I don't know if I've really talked about much in, in different studies. But I'm thinking how to work this whole thing in, and I'm thinking, well, you know, I just need to say this. Um, God calls certain men for the ministry. The Apostle Paul, um, he's there and he's blind and whatever else, and, and the Lord says, um, can't, I can never think of the guy's name there, Acts chapter uh, not nine, um, where he says to him, you know, go to Damascus and whatever else. And, um, and he says for Paul is a, you know, basically Paul's a chosen vessel and I'm, you know, show him how much, how many things he's going to have to suffer. Sorry, I'm, I'm botching the verse really badly, but it's not part of my notes and whatever. But the whole thing is he's a chosen vessel. Uh, Jeremiah, um, before I formed thee in, in the womb, I knew thee and I ordained thee, of you know, as, as a, prophet um there's a choosing that's there and you might not understand that early on you might not understand why you had such a high standard but later on the lord calls you into ministry and you realize wow thank you lord you were there for me that whole time um the lord put certain things into my mind to prepare me for what i am today and if you'd gone back and told me that back was when i was a teenager or something hey you're going to be a preacher known all around the world i'd have said no, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm studying to be a motorcycle mechanic. Uh, okay, let me show you this real quick. If I haven't ever shown this. There's my diploma. I'm an official, um, what is it? Um, motorcycle repair, uh, study of motorcycle repair. I'm a certified motorcycle repair technician. <laughs> Did a correspondence course and things on it. I was going to actually, you had to do at least this to get into the one place I was going to be a mechanic. There's my diploma, a real diploma, um, signed by the people and everything else. Um, that's what I was going to be. That's my higher education. <laughs> uh, I wanted to be a motorcycle mechanic slash motocross racer. Preacher? No, no. But as a young man, there were two things that were very strong for me, and those two things relate very heavily to the ministry in the future. I didn't drink. I had no temptation to drink. Uh, the only alcohol I've ever had in my life was uh, while I was in uh, visiting relatives in West Virginia the one time, and they said, here, try this. And I said, what is it? And, they, and I went like this. They said, oh, it's peach flavored or whatever. And I, I took a little sip, and they said, oh, it's moonshine. I, I said, okay. It was, it was just like an eighth of an inch in the bottom of the thing. I said, I said, it tastes good, but I said, you know, I don't, I don't drink. And they said, yeah, I know. That's why we didn't give you a big thing of it or whatever. That was one time. And then another time, like I said, I tried wine and it tasted like cough syrup. And I said, you know, expensive, overpriced nonsense. I'd rather drink kombucha, which is actually good for your probiotics and the whole thing. Um, it doesn't make me feel weird or whatever. Um, I never got drunk. Never. Lord knows I'm telling the truth on that. You want to say I'm lying? Well, whatever. I can't help you. I'm telling you the truth. Um, alcohol, never a problem. Um, another thing, I have never been a womanizer, ever. Uh, God gave me a great gift of being absolutely terrible with women. Um, in high school, uh, I was a pretty good looking guy and whatever, and, and most of the popular girls at one point in time, um, tried to get me to date them. You know, they get their friend to say, you know, do you like, you know, Kristen? Uh, well, I don't know. Well, you know, would you ever consider dating Kristen or something, you know, or Amber or some of these other ones and, and things? And I'm giving real names again. I won't give last names, but 
on that. They, you know, they're married now and things that the last name wouldn't even mean anything. But the whole point is, um, I was terrible, terrible. I remember I was in inter intermediate school the one time sitting in the library and there was this table of girls, popular girls over there. And, uh, you know, I was looking at a, you know, book on dirt bikes or something probably. And, and, uh, this one girl gets up, she walks over and she hands me a note and, you know, they're over there giggling at the table, you know, and I was in probably, I think seventh grade and, and uh, they were all eighth grade a year ahead of me. And I remember I opened it up and it says, you know, um, this girl's name likes you. And I remember, I don't remember what her name was, but I remember she had a plaid skirt on and, you know, she was a very pretty girl. And I kind of thought, oh man, you know, she's interested, you know, and then she was looking over and smiling at me and things. You know what I did? I said, hey, you know, here's my chance to, you know, I got up, I took the note, I walked over, dropped it into the trash can and walked out. Yeah, real ladies, man, you know, <laughs> a really good looking girl that's a year ahead of me, not even a girl that was younger or something, an older girl, very popular girl, and she wanted to date me, and I just, no, dropped the thing in there. Sitting in another class, the one time another popular girl, and we're sitting there, and she's sitting right beside me, and she puts her hand over on my leg, about on my knee, you know, and she starts to kind of rub my leg back and forth, and I just kind of went, you know, what are you doing and, and whatever, and just kind of, okay, uh, just push her hand away. I had so many chances to fornicate in high school and things, and I had to take one of them. I never even went on a date. I didn't go to a dance. I didn't do anything in high school. That's how awkward I was, you know. It was all about, you know, my motorcycles, and then I got a Yamaha Banshee, you know, later on in uh, 1987, first year for the Banshee, and uh, that was my life. That's all I wanted to talk about. Wrote at the school the one time, got in trouble. Um, girls? Oh, hey, there's a pretty girl, but are you going to date her? No. You know, out of high school, uh, there was a couple times I thought about dating different girls, and I'd go to meet with them, or, you know, they're, I know where they're working. Oh, she's not here today. And, and it just, I got to a point later on and where I got saved, and I thought, I'm under some kind of curse or something. I cannot meet a girl. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Uh, what was it? God knew I would be in this position someday and he forced me to not get messed up. In his grace, in his foresight, he looked and he said, you're not going to get messed up. You're a chosen vessel. Now, understanding that God had that special thing for me and that he's done this for me, how could I then turn around and betray him and betray his word and sin and cover it up? can't do it. I can't do it. I'll tell you a sin I've had to repent of recently, just to tell you how, how uh, goody two-shoes I am. Um, I listened to some songs from the 1950s. A couple of songs. I was doing my work and whatever else, and I was what I was listening to, you know, uh, it ended, and I saw this song from the 1950s that I was familiar with and whatever, and, you know, I've heard it in the past, and I listened to it, and, um, and I thought, oh, there's that other song. I remember that song. And I started playing these secular songs. I felt like I was out of fellowship with the Lord after that. Got done with my work for the day and I went out and I started to, you know, instead of singing a hymn while making supper or instead of having the hymns going through my head, these 1950s songs are going through my mind. And I thought, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm out of fellowship again with you. That's how seriously I take sin. That's the way it's supposed to be. And again, I'm, I, I have to speak foolishly. I have to speak about myself. I can't tell about other preachers or other ministers or whatever else out there. But brethren, we have to be held to high standards. And I hope and pray if I ever fall from what I am right now, if I ever get messed up somehow, uh, however that would be, I pray God takes me out of the ministry and quite frankly takes me out of this world. And I mean that. Fully mean that. Tell you one other story here. Um, was in right after my wife gave birth to Oliver, and you know the all the stress and everything else you go through. You know when a woman goes through. Um, I delivered Oliver, and everything, and um, but she had some, you know, she needed to recover, and so I said, I'll go and take care of the grocery shopping, and I remember 
um, it's Holton Hannaford, Hannaford Grocery Store. Now I'm in there in the produce aisle, and I remember I was getting red pears. That's what it was. Standing there, and I'm getting these red pears, and I'm, you know, picking this one up, and, you know, feeling that that's a little bit soft. I don't like that one. I, and I hear this, you know, clippity-clop, clippity-clop coming up behind me, you know, high-heeled spike heels, you know, coming up. And I, I didn't even turn and look like this. I just was kind of standing there, heard coming up this way, right beside me, gets close, and I'm, okay, I can smell the chemical perfume there, and I'm thinking, okay, what's going on? And real close real just almost touching me and it just kind of okay you're invading my space here and i'm thinking okay i'm almost done i have to get have to get one more and i don't even know i think she was brunette or something like that and i all i remember is she's right here and she leans forward and does one of these you know kind of thing or whatever showing off there and i just i i went like that and i, just, I saw out of the corner of my eye, eye what she was doing and i just went about face and i just marched i got out of there why well, because my Bible says to flee fornication. That's why. I don't want God dumping me in ministry. I fear God. Oh, but man, you could have at least talked to her, you know, witness to her. <laughs> yeah. Uh, make an excuse like a lot of these street preachers do. They'll go to some beach or whatever else and preach to the girls there, you know, and you're a whore and whatever. And, and uh, they'll come over and they'll be, you know, flirting with the guy and whatever. And they just stand there and take. The Bible says to flee fornication. Walk away. Oh, I'm not tempted. Okay, yeah. Um, that should be the attitude. That much of a prude, of a mid-Victorian prudery or whatever you want to call. Oh, there's a filthy whore here? Oh, no, not looking. I mean, what kind of dumb satanic attack was that anyhow? I th thought about that over the years. I have a wife that I love dearly at home, resting, trying to get over the thing of the trauma of going through the birth process. And I have a brand new little boy. I'm going to mess around with, you know, prostitute here or whatever. <laughs> Good one, Satan. No, that doesn't work. Walked away. You know, I mean, if I wanted to cheat on my wife, I couldn't. I'm not a ladies' man. I've never understood guys that can just go out and flirt with women and whatever else. I never understood that. So, well, you're not much of a man. Then. Well, if that makes you a man going out and being able to fornicate with lots of different women, well, then you must, you know, my dog would probably be very good at that too. So, let's finish up here. A couple more verses to read and then we're done. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that, ye sh that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Can you judge in your Christian groups? Can you go out and search? Again, you know, I contacted from a Pensacola Bible Baptist Church or whatever, Ruckman's Church, while he was still alive. I wrote a letter to, to Ruckman, and he wanted to put it in their, their uh, Bible Believers Bulletin or whatever else. And he had one of his guys call me, and the guy called me, and he said, yeah, he said, we disagree with you on this point about police background checks. And he said, we have to have police background checks down here because we've had a couple child molesters trying to come to school, and we have to kind of talk to them and what Police background checks in churches. <laughs> Anywhere in scripture for this? No, of course not. You're supposed to have judgment among the body of Christ. But it's gotten so bad in these Baptist churches that people can come there, predators can come in there, know that they can get access to other people's children. And know that there's a bunch of floozies in there that they can flirt with. David Hiles, Jack Hiles' son, went to Baptist Church, Baptist Church, just like the Catholics do. They, you know, they sh he gets caught and he's, you know, messing around with women. Then they ship him someplace else, and then he gets caught there, and then they send him some other place. Uh, ended up marrying a porn star. Yeah, David Hiles. Uh, truth. It's in my documentary on uh, Jack Hiles and the whole cult there. But he was fornicating with multiple women. Why? Because they're not judging. They're not purging out the old leaven. I mean, finally, the guy's such a pervert, they finally had to get rid of him, but then they have him speaking at his father's funeral after he's been caught with so many different women. Like he's got some kind of authority or something. Verse 4, If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, no, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren? 
There's nobody out there that can judge. But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because ye go to law one with another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? This little punk, Jeffrey Grider, wrote an article because of Jacob Thompson's article over the winepressnews.com, and I came out and I said, yeah, Jeff Grider, he's a, he's a false Christian. I don't believe the guy's saved. You have that kind of seared conscience. I don't believe he's saved. Just continues. Where's the chastening at? You know, long-haired little sissy boy, little womanizer, you know, and oh, his wife's tears and everything else. Oh, and I think I might have to seek litigation. Well, then you're violating scriptures there, punk. I mean, who do you think you are? You fornicator? Raising millions of dollars and things for your little uh, business that you're running there? You have the nerve to try and sue me? Go ahead. See where it gets you. I pray that the devil destroys you. Whether you're saved or not, I don't think he is. But, you know, if there's no salvation there, well, then he'll just continue on like other lost people do. But if he's genuinely saved, you're headed for destruction. I've seen it numerous times, these guys. Messing around with sin, the Lord exposes them, brings out the truth. Down they go. But you're going to threaten me with litigation. Yeah. Verse 8. Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. Defrauding. You have no right to be in ministry if you're a pervert. None. None. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Not continuing. Well, I, I have, you know, it still continues. I'm broken. <laughs> yeah. Such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. That's going to be it for this sermon. Um, we all need to raise our standards. We can't allow sin in the camp. And I'll tell you right now, there's a great reset that's coming. And there's going to be a lot of death. A whole lot of death. And these fakers are all of a sudden going to see that uh, being a Bible-believing Christian, a real one, is going to cost you something in the future. Persecution will come. It's going to be very difficult. And I can't wait for that. You say, what did you say? I said, I can't wait for that. Because I'm sick and tired of fakes being out there. I'm sick and tired of fake ministries. And if you're going to some church building someplace or whatever else, and you're, you know, I know that there are trad cats that watch this channel. Um, Examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. That's what the Bible says. Your own uh, Reams, Dewey Reams, would say something similar. I don't remember the exact way it would work in there, but um, examine yourself. Look at your own system and see the corruption and say, hmm, I don't think the Lord's behind this. You know, you want to truly know God? Okay, don't join me. Don't become a Protestant. Just have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If this is the sacred scriptures, then you read this. You say, well, the church is, is uh, we have divine tradition as well. Is the church following the divine tradition? Well, um, uh, uh, be honest with yourself. You don't have to join me. I'm a heretic in your sight. Whatever, don't join me. But ask yourself the question, am I part of the right system? Protestants, are you part of the right system? Bible-believing Christians, are you part of the right system? Make sure that you don't give to this ministry if you don't trust me. One of you out there, you hear something or whatever else and you can actually get some proof? Bring it out. Go ahead. Hey, you know what? All this uh, Big Brother stuff and whatever else, you can get police background checks and things. Do it. Make an investment. Look for my uh, background, my uh, criminal background or whatever else. Look for it. You won't find any. Why? Because I fear God. That's why. I want to be in ministry. I want to be able to help people. That's my purpose in life. 
well, I don't trust you. I don't believe in you. Okay. All right, then go invest your money some other ministry. Go trust somebody else. But if you've watched me over the years, you know my spirit. You know what I'm about. And uh, I try my best. And I look at the things that most people would consider to be backward. Oh, you never went out drinking, you know. You, you, you don't know what it's like to go down to the bar and, you know, pick up a chick and whatever else. And I mean, I've met with so many just perverted, wicked people. And I remember this. I remember I looked at this lifted Jeep the one time, a big lift kit on it and everything, an old CJ5, I think it was. Um, and this guy, he was saying about, you know, you have to have a cool looking vehicle if you want to get a little and then referred to something vile. And, um, you know, and I wasn't saved at the time. I was lost, you know, and, and I just kind of, ha, 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 yeah. And I just thought I wouldn't do that if my life depended on it. Even as a lost man, hey, this thing picks up the chicks, man. Yeah, yeah, you can go out and you can get them drunk and then you can fornicate with them. My worst years, I never did it. And I thank God for that. And if any of you out there think of me as less than, a, you're not, not really much of a man because you weren't a fornicating drunk, um, thank you. <laughs> I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not ashamed of my uh, faith and my walk with Jesus Christ and the fact that the Lord had some real mercy for me and He did some real good things for me. I thank Him that uh, He's made me backward. So backward that I'm just terrible with women. I'm awful with it. Um, say this too, the, the time that I was, that I had some wine, I was trying to see if it was any medicinal quality. The one time I drank a whole cup of it, you know, just to see what would happen, I didn't feel anything. I'm probably a very high tolerance to alcohol. You say, wow, you could really get drunk or get drink a lot of alcohol that get, without getting drunk. Uh, why? <laughs> no, thank you. I want as much power as I can have. I want to have as strong a relationship with Jesus Christ as I can possibly have. I don't want any garbage in my mind. I want to bring every thought in my mind into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Um, I could uh, live an off-grid life and go and farm things and grow things and whatever else. And that was my dream. That's why I bought the property that I bought. Because I thought, God's going to say, okay, you, you've done the work for me and now you can kind of retire and go out and fade away and just be this off-grid wilderness guy and whatever that I always dreamed of being. But yet the fight is there. The fight's raging. And um, I'm willing to sacrifice my dream. Go back on grid, go back. You know, I always have off-grid capabilities. I, you know, I always have a wood stove and have ways to have lighting and you know, get water some other way other than you know, electricity. Don't get me wrong, I'm not going to become dependent on the system, but uh, I need to be there for the body of Christ. And um, that's a very high calling. And it's scary sometimes because I can feel myself, I start to get pulled away by my flesh and by the world. And the devil sometimes gets me. And I have to think, stop, repent, get right with God. Go through the list. Go through the checklist. Because I don't want to crash and burn like others have. And if you're wicked out there and you've got it covered up, rest assured, God is going to bring it to light. And it will be published on the housetops. It will be published everywhere that you are a vile, wicked hypocrite. And the Lord will have your day come and it'll be over for you. That's going to be it for this study. Here's the hymn book. I'm done with it. Got the whole way through it. we are talking about a lot of the hymns in here. Um, amazing hymns. I probably know about a tenth of them. <laughs> it's amazing. Some of the hymns I thought I knew, I looked in here and, oh, wait, this wording's different. I, I never heard this wording before. Um, tremendous book. So what is it? That will be shown in a future video to be continued, <laughs> as I used to do uh, on television back when I was a, a boy. They'd do that thing, to be continued next week. Um, but uh, this is the hymn book that was sent to me. Absolutely amazing. Um, they have a leather edition or whatever else, and I thought, 
It's very expensive. You know, should I get it? And I thought, well, people are going to say, what about the leather edition? Is it worth the money? And I thought, well, okay, it's going to be our hymn book, our family hymn book now because I, I love it. Um, so I ordered the leather one. I'm waiting for it to come. After it gets here, it should be here probably within the next few days, Lord willing. I'm going to have to set up I have my overhead camera thing up here. Off, You can't see it, but it's up here. I put a camera here. I have a monitor over there. little table thing here that I can do the overhead shots. Um, going to try to get to it, uh, get that overhead camera done. I have a number of letters. I know one of you keeps um, writing in the comments, did you get to my letter yet? When are you going to be making a video? Please be patient. Okay, I actually got... Uh, a couple of things here. I just remembered this, um, you know, folder of stuff to go through here. I'm not going to show the address and uh, th something from uh, Great Britain, I think it is, right there. Yeah. Uh, didn't try to show that. There's another one there, another one here. Um, so, and I have a whole stack over there on top of my computer. So. Um, Researching, being a father, doing my sermons, answering people's emails, um, the few that do have my email address, uh, writing back and forth with people, uh, doing some Skype conversations, I, you know, dealing with people locally. It's a very busy life, so please forgive me. Um, uh, uh, it's a very high calling, and um, I do need your prayers. Again, please pray for me, because... You know, I try to be strong in this whole thing, try to do my very best, but uh, I can't do it on my own, and I need the prayers of God's people, and I'm feeling the prayers a lot of times. You know, there's there's been times I go really down depression-wise, and I can start to feel the, the prayers of God's people. I think the Lord puts it in your heart. Play, please pray for Brother Brian right now. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's another thing I've had uh, for many years, depression problems. That's uh, been a big thing and I, I read in the Bible where the Lord he had you know um, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and Paul writes about having continual sorrow in my heart yeah I can relate um, but uh, just want to put this stuff out there to encourage the brethren but uh, we cannot put up with leaven we have to purge it out okay that's the if I can give you one thing to remember from this whole study purge out there the old leaven Porge out there for the old leaven, that we may be a new lump. That's what we want. So that's going to be it. We will see you in upcoming videos. Um, please check out our website, the new website there. And um, that's going to be it. Thank you for watching.